Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first Global Peace Building Center webinar for educators, entitled Women Tackling Terrorism, a conversation with Dr. Kathleen Kingst. My name is Anne-Louise Colgan, and I direct the Global Peace Building Center here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. On behalf of all of our team, I'd like to thank you for joining us this afternoon. The Global Peace Building Center is USIP's public education program which focuses especially on engaging the next generation of peace builders. We do a lot of work with and for educators, and we place great value on the work you do to bring knowledge and skills to young people to equip them to engage effectively in this complicated world. So we hope this new webinar series will be a great resource that will provide you with new ideas for teaching your students about important issues of conflict and peace. Today we're focusing on women tackling terrorism, and frankly, this topic could not be more timely. First, because our news headlines seem increasingly dominated by threats and instances of terrorism around the world, but also because this is Women's History Month. Each March, the Global Peace Building Center and USIP more broadly celebrate the important contributions of women to peace building. And today, we think it important that we understand the ways in which women are taking a stand to prevent violent extremism in countries around the world. They are often leading the charge in their own communities and making a difference in ways that it is important for us to understand and that deserve our attention. So we are thrilled that our colleague, Dr. Kathleen Kienest, is here this afternoon to share her expertise and a new action kit her program has developed on this subject. Now, let me turn the mic over to my colleague, Megan Chabalowski, who will facilitate the rest of the conversation today. And I would like to thank her and the rest of our team for their great effort in putting this event together. And I look forward to seeing you again at future webinars. Great. Thank you for the welcome, Anne Louise. Um, I am so pleased to be hosting this webinar and to have you joining us. Um, I'm also really pleased that we have a lot of people in attendance, which is fantastic. Um, I took a quick uh, note of where everyone is from, from what I could tell. Uh, we have participants from California and Florida, uh, and I was just thinking that I hope you have warmer weather than we're having right now on this early spring day in D.C. Uh, we have participants from Michigan, Massachusetts, our neighbors in Maryland and Virginia, Oregon, Washington, D.C., and then folks are joining us from Tanzania, Nepal, the Czech Republic, and Uganda. So I'm really glad to see a few old friends, so uh, hello, and to welcome some new faces to our webinar. Um, and if I miss somewhere where you're from, please send it in. Uh, you'll see a chat box, a question and chat box on the right-hand side of your, your uh, screen, and my colleague will let me know where you're from. I want to make sure we have everybody. Um, we also have in this room, even though you can't see everyone else, we have, of course, Dr. Kathleen Keenis sitting next to me. Um, we do still have Anne-Louise Colgan. Um, and my colleague, Denson Staples, who will be helping us gather questions and comments. And we have my colleague, Irina Belitsky, who is uh, going to be live tweeting this event. So we have a full room here, even though you can't see everybody. Um, so if you would like to tweet about this webinar, I think you see a hashtag in the corner of the slide, uh, which is GPC webinar, and we encourage you to tweet about it throughout. Um, so. Uh, this webinar, as a reminder, is going to be recorded, so it will be available on our website. You can find it later this week. And uh, just real quick, I want to check with Denson to see if there are other places that I, I missed. Okay, so I got everybody. Fantastic. Um, so I wanted to review with you really quickly the agenda, so we all are on the same page. Uh, so we heard from Anne Louise. I will really quickly go over some logistics, since this is our first webinar, so we're all on the same page. And then we will hear from, from Kathleen. Um, and then following our conversation with Kathleen, there will be an opportunity for questions from our participants and an opportunity to make some classroom connections. Um, you'll see a, a link on this slide, which leads you to the PDF of the action kit that Kathleen will be talking about. So um, I think Denson will also send it to you in the chat box. So if you'd like to download it, you can have it there with you right now. Um, so please, I want to encourage you to participate. Send us questions and comments uh, so we can make this as useful as possible for you. Uh, so to review logistics really quickly, letting everybody know all participants are muted. You are all automatically muted. So grab a cup of coffee, eat a snack. It's fine. We won't hear you. 
Um, if you'd like to send questions and comments, you can do so through the, the question chat box, as I, we talked about, and you can see it there with an arrow pointing to it. And uh, Dennis and my colleague will, will, will gather them and ask Kathleen them during the Q&A. So uh, just as a, a reminder here, if your dashboard disappears, um, it sometimes does that if you're doing something else, so you can make it reopen by clicking on that red arrow. Um, and if the Global Peace Building Center staff uh, sends you a message, a little message icon will appear. So you just click on that and you see a message. Um, and last but not least, if you're having technical difficulties, send us a note, um, and Denson will try to help you as much as possible. So since you're going to be hearing a lot from Denson, um, I wanted to give him a chance to say hello. So you want to jump in? Hi, everyone. We're so excited to have you here today. I'll be working on the technical side of things and looking forward to your comments and questions. Thanks so much. Okay, well, wonderful. Well, let's get started. Um, without further ado, I'd like to really welcome Dr. Kathleen Keenest. Thank you for being here. Um, I, I wanted to tell them a little bit about you so they, they know who you are. So Kathleen is the director of our Center for Gender and Peace Building here at USIP. Um, and the center focused on gendered impacts of conflict and post-conflict transition on both men and women. So this is probably something that will come up as well when you speak. Um, she is the co-editor of the book, which I have here, Women in War, Power and Protection in the 21st Century, which is a very powerful book. Um, and it really confronts stereotypes about women as victims of war and instead focuses on the critical role that they play, should play, in peace building. So you can find this on USIP's website if you're interested or, or online. Um, but in addition to Kathleen's expertise in gender and conflict, uh, she's also worked for 15 years in the international development field. Um, and has uh, regional expertise in Central Asia, and where you've written extensively on the impact of post-Soviet transition on Muslim women. So uh, a variety of experiences, and we're so glad you can be here. And I just want to echo Anne Louise in saying that uh, we really think this conversation about women preventing violent extremism is incredibly timely and couldn't be more important. So I was thinking when I was putting this together, one of the reasons we thought this issue would be really important right now is that um, whenever I'm reading the news, and especially these days reading about the challenges of, that confront the world in dealing with violent extremism, I'm feeling very disheartened. Um, I, there's not much out there about the good news. And so that's why this conversation is so important right now, to be giving us the good news of what people in communities are doing. So I'm really glad to have you here to be sharing this, these stories with us. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to you to get a chance to talk about the action kits and fill us in on it. So, thank you. It's all yours. Thank you all. And uh, it is really uh, my pleasure and an honor to be at the first webinar. And I'm really excited. Um, well, I first want to just say a, a few more thoughts about my background only because I think it will help you understand some of the motivations uh, and the processes we've used in terms of understanding the roles and possibilities that women play in preventing violent extremism. Um, I was on the ground during the collapse of the Soviet Union and then its transition and its sudden appearance of countries where there was once only one country. And it is very interesting to watch a society come to terms in terms of transition. And one of the very, very first things you see in a transitional space, whether it's a disaster, an economic change, a war, or a change in government, or uh, in this case, a huge change in governance, mm -hmm. uh, is that the question of gender roles start to be discussed. Mm -hmm. It is a basic tenet in the field of anthropology that gender is really not another name for women. In fact, men are gender beings, and in fact, gender is something that is very much learned in our everyday communities, our families, of course, uh, in our schools, religion, institutions. We learn what are 
the rules that are acceptable for a man, a woman, a girl, a boy, and which roles are not. And furthermore, gender is really also a much larger understanding of one's identity that crosses between masculinity and femininity. I think it's important to begin there because um, too often we um, oversimplify gender and over homogenize the concept that gender means women and women are some kind of one unit and they're very similar. We all know all of that is not accurate. Um, but it's important I, uh, in the policy shaping world that we remind uh, in our design of projects, in our attempt to make a difference, that we actually don't do more harm, that we understand truly the diversity in gendered identity. So if that's one takeaway from the next few minutes, I hope uh, you have that one down, that gender is not another name for women. And it's critical that we see gender in all its um, identities and also um, flexibilities. Because what we do see, and we are seeing right now, and what Megan was talking about, you know, picking up the newspaper, I do the same. And I go, oh my goodness, what is happening to our world today? And I also have middle school children who ask the same questions. So as a teacher, I empathize with uh, you and your role of trying to help young people make sense of the enormous transitions uh, going on in the world and then certainly in terms of gendered identities. Um, I would add here that as societies undergo some kind of rapid transition, as we're seeing in those uh, societies that are very much affected by a violent extremist movement. Uh, what we see is that gender roles are among the first things that become situated as to what you can and cannot do. And one of uh, the areas that I think is worth spending a moment talking about is the fact that we may focus in on women during this discussion, but I'd like to just for a second talk about young men in this process. Because one of uh, the working theories of a fellow anthropologist of mine, Mark Summers, um, and, and a former uh, USIP fellow here, uh, talks about what happens in societies and countries where there is a sense of failed adulthood. In other words, as a young man, uh, you know, in some societies there are certain rites of passage or certain things that you must acquire in order to be considered a man. And that sense that maybe you can't do it in the society you're working in is one of those ideas currently being contemplated about why the surge of uh, violent extremism in these countries undergoing rapid and, if, if you will, radical change. I'm thinking here of Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, uh, and of course Syria. Um, but we see it in our own countries as well, um, and I, I understand uh, we have people from perhaps Nigeria, and it's a country we're working in as well. Um, so in saying that here, uh, I wanted to introduce the concept that when we're talking about preventing violent extremism, we're talking about a very gendered process. In other words, it's it's not a silo, it's not something over here, a little box, okay, and now we're going to work with women on this. Mm -hmm. It is, we know that gendered identities are, in fact, being instrumentalized in many of these violent extremist groups. It is uh, very clear what you can wear, what you can eat, what you can do, what you mm -hmm. can't do, 
by the fact are you a man or a woman and it is becoming more and more obvious that there is this kind of sex segregation going on mm -hmm. in which there are roles and and uh, expectations for for both uh, men and women. So what does this all mean? Now I'm going to answer a little bit more about uh, why all of this matters in the security field. And it's impossible to talk about violent extremism uh, without talking about security. And one of the other takeaways that I hope you um, uh, is either written down or it gets reworked into some lesson plan here today is the fact that we have over the last 20 years as an international community made enormous headway in the security sector in understanding that by the way, security is a gendered field, and that it has been more or less organized in a very masculine approach to protection and also a sense that men go to war, women and children stay home. Over the last 20 years, that has changed dramatically because we know what was once the front line has become the front doorstep. Could you just, when you, we talk about security sector, what are we talking about? What does security mean in that context? Well, in this context that I'm talking yeah. about, I'm talking about the organized institutional sphere of influence that, uh, you know, understands what is happening in the world and how using uh, uh, militarized forces, yeah. uh, uh, militaries, uh, police, uh, and other security actors to help bring control back to a society, a country mm -hmm. that has lost control, has been uh, affected by violent conflict or violent extremism. Why I brought security into the picture is in order to understand this shift going on about the role of women and their empowerment in the security field, we have to understand that 15 years ago, the United Nations Security Council, that means a very elite group of countries focused on the security of the world. We're not talking the General, General Assembly, which includes all countries of the world, but this is a select and powerful group of security um, uh, countries focused on how to maintain a peaceful world. They passed a Security Council resolution, which is now nicknamed 1325, and many of you may know of it, many of you may not, but I wanted you to have it as a marker, because I don't think we can really understand women preventing violent extremism unless you understand this particular security resolution, because it is an international um, agreement and it has um, uh, conditions that we sign up to say it matters to the world. And 1325 was very simple in the sense that it, for the first time, recognized that women were not only needing to be counted in war. I mean, for many, many centuries, we counted only soldiers who died in war. We did not count the women who maybe were nurses, who were maybe on the front lines in some other capacity besides carrying a gun, but we did not count them in the um, uh, casualties. Nor did we count the fact that in many of these wars, sexual violence against women and men for that matter and children were not considered uh, a criminal act. And so when we think about 1325, uh, it's critical because it was a game changer in how we began to understand mm -hmm. the security sector and to say women are not only victims of war, we need to count them mm -hmm. and, and acknowledge this, but they are also powerful uh, 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 providers of peace, and they are often the majority of the people left. 
after a war. Take Rwanda, 70% of the survivors were women out of that genocide. So we have to begin to count women into the story of security. So 1325 really is an important marker. 15 years ago, uh, this particular resolution was passed, and out of that resolution has come many other resolutions, what we call the sister resolutions, to address other nuances of women in war. And now we are beginning to talk about women in violent extremism. They are not the same. We know that violent extremism happens in countries that are not um, in a violent conflict. But we also see in the world today, uh, uh, in countries like Libya, that has gone through uh, a violent conflict and a violent civil war, and now also dealing with violent extremism. Syria is another example. So what is uh, uh, the concept of women in violent extremism? So three years ago, uh, we uh, embarked on a very interesting, if you will, pilot study to really ask the question, how could women uh, actually prevent violent extremism in their multiple roles? Mothers, teachers, professionals, uh, market in the market, maybe as a religious leader, but they play many roles of influence. And what are they already doing, and what could they do better if they had basic understanding of what is radicalization? What does it look like? What should you be looking for, for example, in your community? If you're a teacher, in one of your students, if you're a mother, in one of your children. And just, again, beginning to ask the question, going back to that security sphere, that women can play a positive and proactive role as a security actor, if you will, in preventing violent extremism. So it's like putting on a new lens. Uh, I, I love uh, Abby Disney, who uh, was the producer of the film you may have seen, Pray the Devil, Back to Hell. Sorry. Uh, she said, you know, the way we understand war is through basically John Wayne's pit helmet, mm -hmm. as if there was a camera. And that is war through the eyes of a man who is in battle. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is understand not only violent conflict through the eyes of women, but also violent extremes. Mm -hmm. So these studies, uh, the first study really looked at um, what are women already doing, and we began in two countries, Nigeria and Kenya. And in these countries, uh, there is not a war per se, but there are extreme acts of brutal and violent extreme myths. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it is being, being a woman in these countries is often dangerous. Being a woman who is uh, really a leader looking at this issue is especially dangerous. So I say that because I deeply respect uh, these women who have stepped up to take on this role of leadership in their societies. So let me tell you a little bit about what that looks like. Uh, for example, and I'm going to begin with Marianne, who lives in Garissa in the northern part of Kenya. She's been working to engage teachers, because teachers are with kids, as you know, eight hours a day. They hear, they watch, they observe things mm -hmm. that sometimes parents and certainly really busy mothers who are attending to maybe other children, also dealing with food. And in these communities, we're talking in, in villages. So there's not the um, added uh, advantage that many of us live in, electricity, running water. So they are busy people managing a household. And so Marianne began to work with teachers about how to look for signs in both boys and girls of radicalization. Very simple. This is not rocket science. 
you know, a change in interest, uh, an obsession with a certain kind of uh, idea or perhaps ideology or a certain in, uh, kind of dramatic shift in religious practices. Mm -hmm. All of those things, and of course all of these are context driven. Um, she began working with teachers. Well, not only has it helped the teachers um, understand more about what's happening in these classrooms, and again, this is right on the border of uh, Somalia, and so there are refugee camps very nearby, so they are dealing with very complex human systems and changing uh, systems, uh, transitions, if you will. They felt very positive about you know, being a part of this, if you will, early warning system. They also, because they began to talk to one another as teachers about this, they didn't feel so alone about it. That's, it's, again, this is not rocket science, it's about communication. In the same way, I will leap to Delhi, India, where Archana works in a radio program. It's called Mothers on Air. And she really gives voice to this issue of radicalization in these small villages or mid-sized towns. We're not talking urban environments here. We're talking about giving voice to often people, and especially women, who not even had a voice in their own family. Mm -hmm. And so she has... Uh, develop these in listening clubs where mothers are able first to talk among themselves about their concerns of violent extremism and then eventually through the radio talk about it. Now so what you have to imagine is a situation in which this woman in one case uh, they talked about this one woman who really did not want to go on the radio. She said, nobody will listen to me. Nobody listens to me at home. Why? Not even my own children. Why would anybody listen to me on the radio? But eventually, she did go on the radio. And she had a lot to say. How did she get there? How did she move to feeling comfortable? She wanted the radio. It, well, that is what this, uh, this one uh, program called the Mother School. It's out of... Uh, uh, a program called Women Without Borders, in uh, and it it is uh, been launched by mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, Edith Schlafer out mm -hmm. of uh, Vienna, Austria, and it's been uh, basically piloted now in six different countries. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting, these countries are very diverse, obviously, but. The process has been really similar and the, the results are very exciting because it also follows, if you will, the wisdom of 1325 and that is as women have voice, they are themselves empowered. You cannot empower somebody else. Mm -hmm. It is a process of self-empowerment mm -hmm. as they are able to talk about what they are witnessing what their own knowledge is. It's not coming from outside, it's coming from within the community. Mm -hmm. So much of it is about dialogue, listening, and recognizing what they can do better together than they can do alone. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should stop there and take this a break. Yeah, take a breath. breath. <laughs> I wanted to show, we have a couple slides here. I wanted to show some slides from your, your action kit, first of all, because they're beautiful. Um, to give people a taste. And I think some of the themes that you'll see in the, the titles here, the different sections are ones that you hit on. Um, the, the art is just incredible. And I think you can also find activities in here, exercise as yes, well. Right. Sh shall I, because I know yeah, that just, we're uh, working with, I know, very talented <laughs> teachers. Um, part of the action kit uh, is really uh, two things. We wanted to uh, make something that is really what I would call 101 to the violent extremism. So we asked uh, nine different experts that we know to write something that was 
what I said, out of the box, a little around the corner. Mm -hmm. Tell us what we should know in the future about women preventing violent extremism. So the essays are short, about 500 words each, really meant to be stimulating and, and informational, but not academic. Just here's what, mm -hmm. you know, would be helpful to think multidimensional about the many roles women are playing, mainly for good in preventing violent extremism, but we do need to recognize just as boys and men are being radicalized, so are girls and women, and we should not be blind to that fact. And the motivations, we're still learning a lot about why, uh, for example, the, the young women in London got on a plane yeah. to Istanbul uh, and uh, joined uh, the extremist group uh, known by some as Daesh, by others as ISIL, and by some as uh, the Islamic State. Um, well, in, in the exercises, uh, it talks about asking participants uh, how, what are the areas in their, their community where women have a lot of influence, and what areas do men have influence over. And what we have found in all the work we've done is that, you know, you may know something about violent extremism mm -hmm. and you may not, but everybody has an opinion on gender. Mm -hmm. yes. It's a great topic to be <laughs> in any discussion yeah. about. And certainly there are a lot of complaints. Mm -hmm. Men don't do this, women don't do that, and whatever else. But it begins a conversation because what everyone recognizes is whatever the gender roles they grew up with mm -hmm. have changed. The rules of the game have changed. And some of those rules are being used against women. Some of them are being used against men. And we have to understand that before we can begin to understand the spheres of influence. In addition, uh, it talks a lot about, uh, we have a couple of resources in here. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between dialogue and debate? Mm -hmm. We see sometimes uh, in working with groups that in their educational process, uh, they have, if you will, conflated dialogue with debate mm -hmm. and or conflated debate with dialogue. Let's see which way, to, <laughs> either way will work. But the point is that sometimes we don't listen enough. And that is a problem when you're trying to solve a community problem. And that's why the third section is all about engaging communities. Um, because in many ways, uh, the foundational blocks for really preventing violent extremism begins in identifying the problem. You know all of these as teachers. You do this every day in your classrooms, identifying the problem, talking about what are the various solutions and actions to make a difference. And it, again, is a very uh, process-oriented uh, effort. Uh, there is no silver bullet. Human dynamics, human change, changing a human society takes time. It takes leadership. It takes hope in that leadership. And uh, we are fully convinced that women are uh, key in our global efforts to stem violent extremes. Thank you. And I, going back to the dialogue and debate, that's also something you do, we find so important as well with our teachers. Students do a lot of debating in school. Yes. We don't do as much dialogue. Either. We learn the rules of debate. That's right, we do. The rules of, not the rules of dialogue. And so that's something that we have a lot of activities on is how do you become really good at listening and communicating. Um, so it, please take a look at this because there's a lot of great exercises. Um, I wanted to, to follow up on and show a couple pictures here. I have two slides of some photos of the women that you were talking about and when they were here to, to share their work. Um, at the launch of your action kit, but also in the celebration of what they're doing so they can learn lessons from each other. Um, so I have a group photo, and then I also, here's some um, photos of these women in action during the three days they were here. I was wondering, the two women, Mary Ann and Archana, Archana 
Are they are they any any of these photos? I'm afraid you can't see the one on the far right. But. Yeah, Archana is uh, the woman I'm speaking with there mm -hmm. uh, in the blue. Mm -hmm. uh, she's from Delhi, and she's the one who has worked with community radio mm -hmm. and the listening clubs. Uh, and she has uh, really, uh, you know, you can imagine the reach oh, yeah. when you have radio, and uh, you know, the dialects in India are. Yes, mm -hmm. I think you might know that. Hundreds, I don't know exactly, but hundreds, yes. But uh, she actually okay. um, works in the various islands mm. as well. Great. So this is great impact. You know, so much of what we think about today is, you know, social platforms and cell phones, and uh, those are a powerful uh, force, and we know, it, especially among young people, because certainly uh, social media has played a role in uh, enticing young people into these violent extremist groups. But I think what Archana and then Tasneem, I'm looking to see if you have a picture of Tasneem. She's from Pakistan. She is also doing this kind of parallel universe in terms of radio. But I think what they really um, helped us look at was that we need to also think low-tech. Mm -hmm. Radio is low-tech. It doesn't uh, require a television, a mm -hmm. phone. Uh, people can be working while listening. And it has enormous impact. Mm -hmm. And these dialogue shows that they run, yeah. so that the, it is this kind of mm -hmm. discussion, listening, uh, asking questions, that uh, women do call in. And they are uh, not afraid because they're hearing things that are one familiar to what's going on in their life, mm -hmm. but not having to show their face, but only a voice. It gives them some sense of privacy, protection. As I said, this is dangerous work, and it also uh, helps them recognize, and this is critical, that they're not alone. You know, we think a lot about or hear a lot about the young people who perhaps become extremists and commit violent acts, but we know less about its impact on the family unit. And there's, for many, great shame, great isolation. And so it's not only the loss of a child into a violent community or a violent extremist community, but it is also being ostracized in the community. So there's great sense of uh, isolation. Mm -hmm. So what these radio programs do, or I like it, Mothers on Air, uh, they help close that gap. It gives them a sense uh, of listening to what other people are doing to make a difference. And I always say that Peace building is really about human imagination. Mm -hmm. And when we see an idea that another community is doing to make a difference, we go, wow, if they can do it, I could do that. And it's contagious, mm -hmm. just as yeah. we see that violence is contagious. Yeah. But good, good acts, good deeds, mm -hmm. good efforts, and good teaching mm -hmm. is also contagious. And uh, we need more to make sure these stories are yeah. out there so that when you open your newspaper tomorrow morning, Megan, I'll feel inspired. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so on that note, I mean, why aren't these stories out there? So they are happening, and we're hearing these success stories here, and maybe here at USIP, um, but why aren't they making it into, into the headlines or, in, I don't know, to more people? Well. Maybe I where do you go to find these stories? You well, know? no, and that is a great uh, that is a good question okay. because they these the, the flatness of the world, if you will, with social media has many good stories out there, and so we do have a chance to select, mm. and we can through our social platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and other such um, uh, efforts, uh, actually learn about the stories and spread those good ideas. Uh, but uh, we have a long ways to go with print media, and uh, it is still uh, not 
the first thing that's put on the first page. Yes. But there are a lot of other good stories throughout. That's right. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Turn, turn into the middle and get into my uh, So I, I wanted to ask you a question about um, about young people. Yep. So uh, it's like spreading the stories and inspiring people through hearing stories that they're not alone. And, and one thing we do in the Institute is, or here at the Global Peace Building Center, but also in the Institute, is that of course we believe really strongly in, in the ability of young people to enact change, to drive change. And we encourage people to take action to build peace. But then the question, of course, is always, okay, but what can I do? Um, and especially when it's such a, the issue is so huge, and as is this issue. And so I'm wondering if you have advice for young people about how, what they could do. Um, how they can get involved in some way. Whether they're here in the U.S. and learning about this in their classrooms, through our, our participants and teachers, or uh, maybe they're in the other countries that are represented here as well. Um, any thoughts you had? Well, first of all, they should visit USIP's website, and yep. especially the Global Peace Building Center, where there is curriculum mm -hmm. on uh, peace building. And uh, always great ideas and, uh, and, a, and a good um, dialogue that you carry on with students and teachers. And I think that's very important to have what is called a community of practice. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of feelings about your question. One is, um, because of the, the social media platforms, there are so many positive things you can do. Um, the one thing I say to my own kids is the first place to begin is do not buy into any kind of bullying. First, you know, stop there. Don't let negativity uh, control the social media platforms. Put out good ideas. It starts with you, yourself, you know. So take a stand first in that way. Second, um, I'm impressed by the number of young uh, musicians, actors, actresses who have taken positive stands and helped young people look at opportunities for social action. Mm. I think that is a, a, a way forward and uh, one in which uh, there are many young people engaged. Uh, I also think that within schools uh, there can be uh, ways that as uh, parents and teachers, we create, could create better uh, campaigns. I mean, we have the science fair, we have the history fair. But do we have the peace building fair? Good ideas for bringing peace into the world. And so we get a sponsor. We get sponsors from the local restaurants mm -hmm. that create a trophy. Mm -hmm. We have to incentivize uh, Peace mm -hmm. I'm going to put a plug in here for uh, Peace Clubs. Yes. We just started an initiative called Peace Clubs that, uh, that lets students take the idea of what an action they want to take and run with it. And it teaches them what skills will you need in order to take action on this issue that's really important to you and your community globally. And, um, and then tell us what you're doing. So take this action and then let us know what happened and how it went so that we can share your story. I love it. So it's an example of right, Peace Building Fair. So if anybody out there sort of takes a peace building fair idea, let us know. We'd love to hear about it. Or the peace club. Or the peace yes. club. We'd love to hear Or any other idea. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, I want to make sure we get to uh, some of our participants and make sure you have a chance to ask some questions. So um, I'd love, I'm going to turn it over to Denson and see if uh, he wants to share some either questions or comments that people have shared with, with him. Absolutely. We have actually a slew of questions, but I hope we have time for <laughs> All right. We'll do our best. Um, there is one question here by Bridget Schultz and another educator also who has asked um, for you to talk more about how women are disproportionately affected by extremism. Mm -hmm. It seems that more and more women are joining extremist causes. Why do you think that is? Mm -hmm. So it's a two-part mm -hmm. question. Yeah, it, would you mind just throwing out three questions so, mm -hmm. uh, oh, in case I can connect yeah. them? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. We have another question here about what is the role of men in supporting women who are trying to prevent violent extremism? Is there a role for fathers or the young boys and male students that we teach as well? Um, and we have a third question about, you touched on this a little bit, Kathleen, talking about how technology can be leveraged for peace building, but a question here from Pakistan about people in communities who are not well-resourced. 
especially those in the nonprofit sector, what are some actions that they can do to help reduce the risk of radicalization? Well, great questions. Thanks so much. Well, um, I'm actually going to begin with the role of men and, and indeed fathers. Um, we have started an initiative here at uh, the Institute of Peace called Men, Peace, and Security. Mm -hmm. And the reason is um, that we need to engage men in this effort of, of course, gender equality, but also to help understand in uh, many parts of the world, um, men do play the role of gatekeeper. And so we are trying to more and more in uh, our work engage fathers in uh, their role as a father um, uh, and helping them understand that in having a daughter be educated uh, is really not only economically smart, but also uh, it gives voice to, if you will, that security sector that I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. in which when women have voice and recognize things that are going on in the family or in the community and say, I'm really concerned because something's changing here. Uh, it is an actual security action. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're very engaged in making sure men are part of the storyboard. One of our participants was a man, Omar, from Zanzibar, and he has been very engaged in the mother schools. And after running five mother schools in Zanzibar on preventing violent extremism, he said, I really have to get the fathers engaged. It's not enough that this burden is left to the mothers. It has to be a whole of community effort. And I don't think anyone could have said it better. You know, it really starts with the parents communicating about what they're seeing and ways that they can help protect their community, their families. Um, the question about are women disproportionately affected? Absolutely. I mean, there is no doubt uh, what we're seeing in, um, I am thinking very much about Iraq right now and Syria, Libya. Uh, women are uh, in part uh, deserted. Uh, they are being brutally uh, physically and emotionally and sexually uh, uh, hurt. Uh, they are having their children taken from them. There are many things that are really criminal here. Uh, this is not about war. This is criminality. And you see uh, the euphemism of children or child brides, but really we're talking about uh, the trafficking of human beings. So indeed, uh, they are uh, extremely vulnerable. And what we're seeing in uh, the Syrian refugee camps, for example, you have a lot of women, you have boys, you have girls, you have perhaps elderly uh, men and women, but you have no young men. Mm -hmm. And what is happening is uh, they need Number one, they need dialogue, they need education, uh, they're asking for better understanding about what's going on. I mean, three years ago, they were living an everyday life, and it's as if you might as well have called it a tidal wave. Mm -hmm. It's like overnight, their worlds have turned upside down, and they're very traumatized. So we need more uh, education on post-traumatic stress, what it means in the family. There are so many skill sets that the world has, and some of what they need is information. Information, person to person, is fabulous. In some of these settings, we know it's dangerous. Um, and so, again, uh, to the question from Pakistan, um, one of the examples given a couple of weeks ago in a community where there was not electricity for radio or battery-powered radios. 
um, they resorted to a chalkboard in the middle of, of this small village and they would write uh, you know, messages for those who were illiterate. They had somebody who uh, uh, explained the message, what the concern was, were worried about this, and so they were in sense of uh, public translators. Mm -hmm. so, so the board was there and people could just write up their concerns. Yes. Or, or they if they could not write. Yes. Because uh, literacy becomes an yeah. issue here. And that's why radio is such an incredible yeah. force for good. Thank you. Uh, do we have, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions if we have. Sure. Let me, I have one more ready to go and it looks like another one that's coming. Great. Um, the next question, Kathleen, is about, um, you, you talked about the importance of regarding men as gendered beings. Mm -hmm. What are the practical consequence, consequences of this shift in thinking? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I would say um, that one of the terms that we have been using in our work, and again, we work in the field of conflict prevention and peace building, and so we work on uh, something that is, the acronym is DDR, uh, Disarmament, Demobilization, and Reconciliation and reintegration, it's actually two hours as well. Um, but one of the things we see is that you you have in a war zone, and now we see it in the violent extremism, you create these kind of um, status symbols of hyper-masculine guys. And you know, uh, the six-pack, the guns, uh, the violence, and what we know certainly from the violent conflict arena is you can take the gun out of their hand, but you don't take the gun out of their mind. Mm -hmm. And this is a famous quote by um, uh, Rep Special Representative uh, Bangura, mm -hmm. who is with the UN. But the problem is, is that we reinforce these um, really um, what in in the southern hemisphere they might call machismo, um, but Hyper, we call it hypermasculine mm -hmm. ideals that do not allow men to be kind of a gentle father, doesn't allow men to cry, doesn't allow men to go to a doctor because you know a real man doesn't go to a doctor. All sorts of, I mean, we could spend an hour just talking about what are all the stories that men have been told about what they can do or can't do to be mm -hmm. a real man, right? So it has a lot of impacts on women, and that's why we decided to start working on the Men, Peace, and Security Agenda, because we can't stop violence against women until we engage men and helping them deal with the violence that they have experienced. We see cyclical violence. Very few, if you look at the world, very few men are violent, but of the violence committed in the world, most is committed committed by men. So we're trying to tackle violence against women through engaging men in the multiple roles that they really have open to them. It's just like women have multiple roles uh, of being also very strong, empowered, and capable mm -hmm. of leadership in the security field. Mm. Um, did we have one more question or was that? Okay, fantastic. Which leads us right into Classroom Connections. Um, because this is a webinar for educators, of course, for our, we'd love to hear from our participants about how they see this issue and what we've been talking about connecting to their work, to your work, um, in your classrooms or elsewhere. Um, so please, if you have any thoughts, please send them our way. and We'd love to share them with everybody. Um, in the meantime, I wanted to make sure we connected you to some of our resources as well that can start this, help you start this conversation in your your classroom or educational space. So as you see here, the Global Peace Building Center has a lot of resources for educators as well as for students on gender and peace building. So there's a whole list here. I, I won't read through it. You can read them. Um, I will add, though, I wanted to point out that in that list is an Ask an Expert. Um, that is an opportunity to come to a, a forum on our website, the Global Peace Building website, and submit questions. And of course, this month's questions go to Kathleen's team. So if you have further questions after this and didn't get a chance to ask them, this is a forum to do so. 
but it's also a place where you can bring this topic back to your, your students or young people you work with and see if they have questions. Um, and then they can, they can submit them to, to Kathleen's team. So this is a way to continue the conversation after this. Um, I also did want to encourage, we do have an educator forum on our website as well, where you can go and continue this conversation amongst yourselves, amongst each other, um, and we can direct you to that. So uh, you can learn more about Kathleen's work as well in their center, uh, the Center on Gender and Peace Building, and, and the website's there. And I wanted to just to, to point out that you, you're going to be editing some video interviews and yes. making them available so you can actually hear some of the women uh, doing this work talk about doing it. So if you could tell us where and when they might yes. find those, and that would be great. Well, uh, you can find uh, the, the Action Kit on our website. Um, and very soon, hopefully by the end of May, uh, it takes a while. We have uh, 15 interviews, oh, great. and we are going to uh, put them into vignettes, so uh, you can uh, look at what's going on in various countries and different approaches, innovative approaches to making a difference. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, do we have any classroom connections? Fantastic. Um, so we had one AP World History teacher who picked up on what you were discussing, Kathleen, about casualties being counted by soldiers killed rather than um, a broader formula for doing so. And so the teacher asked, he, he, he wonders and ponders now how those numbers would change if we included casualties of women and civilians as well. So I guess this could impact how teachers um, teaching world history think about how they teach some of our most violent wars in history. There is a great question here from Abigail Shearer Robinson, mm -hmm. who asks about um, working with young people. How how do we identify someone who's being radicalized all the way to the point where we can take action to evade or mitigate or stop the radicalization of an individual? Do we have an anecdote or um, insight into what the process of radicalization looks like on the individual Yeah, thank you, and thank you for the connection to our teacher. Um, it's, it's an important change to the way we think about mm -hmm. how we teach statistics and history history and who's affected. Um, yeah, what, what are your thoughts on the radicalization? Well, uh, there are a lot of great resources, and maybe we can add those to uh, this classroom connection. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is that uh, the change of character among the youth is, is gradual. And uh, often uh, it doesn't affect just one person, but we see uh, perhaps other family members or uh, peer groups also coming along into this, this if you will, vortex. Um, I will tell you uh, that uh, it is, in some sense, context-driven, but there are clear indicators that, you know, change of behavior is the big one, change of uh, what the focus of their activities. Uh, the change in uh, uh, ideas or combativeness mm -hmm. or aggressiveness. There are all sorts of indicators that have been uh, put together and um, the United Kingdom has probably done some of the deepest research on the issue of radicalization and we can also connect you to the sites of DFID that has a, a, mm -hmm. quite a program on this. Um, I did want to mention, if I could, as to why it is important to see yourself as a, a parent or a teacher, uh, a, a critical uh, interlocker, interlocutor. Sorry, I'm like losing my <laughs> voice here. Um, Kristen uh, Fair, who's an American academic, sampled 141 jihadis, and 35% of them were inducted through family and friends. The others, you know, possibly online, uh, through a mosque or through a church, but not in this case church, but a mosque. Um, the, the key is though, family and friends are critical here, and this is where the community can play a, a very important role. Thank you. Uh, that's about all we have time for today. We're exactly at 5.30. I'm going to take two extra seconds of your time to just tell you about some next steps. Um, please stay tuned for our next webinar. We really hope you found this useful and engaging. Um, we'll let you know when the next one's coming up. After this webinar closes, there's a very brief survey. I promise it's 30 seconds. So please answer it, I promise. 
and it will help us uh, improve our webinars for the next time. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you want to follow up on this webinar or on any of our resources. You have my email address and phone number. Please contact me. And I just very lastly, I want to thank you, Kathleen, for joining us. And thank you. I'm leaving feeling much very hopeful. Um, I think these stories are inspiring, give us a greater context, but also leave us with a sense of hope of, of how we can confront these issues. So. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I look forward to talking to you all. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate you being here and your questions and comments. So thank you and have a, have a great night.